Kraus. I'm uh, from Germany and I work for a consulting uh, company uh, with the name InnoQ. Um, yeah, I talk about uh, microservices, Historix and Eric Java uh, from the perspective uh, how it uh, can help to modernize your systems because most of the time we are not uh, in the nice situation to create a new system from scratch. We yeah, just have to live with systems that already exist and uh, yeah, therefore I think it's uh, a good idea to talk about this in more detail. Um, yeah, I do this by explaining uh, yeah, not really existing system. Uh, it's an e-commerce platform that we started to create uh, in the end of the 90s. Everything was Java based and uh, yeah, there wasn't uh, much time to modernize uh, stuff because yeah, there were always re f feature requests and yeah, we grow and grow and grow. Um, our system has uh, yeah, a lot of internal uh, stuff, but it has also some uh, external uh, dependencies because we are not simply uh, selling our own stuff. We also want to be, be a marketplace where we offer products that uh, yeah, uh, are sold by merchants and um, yeah, we have payment providers that we have to include with talking to a database and uh, so forth. And uh, that causes a lot of uh, problems because um, yeah, we have such a big monolithic system that uh, maintenance is very difficult. Um, feature requests really take a long time because always when we implement something that um, uh, yeah, breaks uh, parts of the system that uh, yeah, have dependency to the stuff but we didn't know about it. We can't modernize our system because, I don't know, we are using an application server that still needs Java 6 or so. Uh, yeah, and um, the, the biggest problem at the moment is that we are very unstable. Uh, so every time some of these merchant systems goes down, our whole application isn't working anymore. And uh, yeah, our developers are so frustrated uh, yeah, and they don't know what to do and uh, they would really like to leave our company. So what are we doing in this situation? Um, the most important stuff in this situation is that uh, yeah, to stabilize the system first because uh, yeah, if our platform is down, Nobody can buy anything, and uh, yeah, that is definitely the biggest problem also from the perspective of our business departments. They make a lot of pressure. Um, and uh, yeah, one of the reasons why we have this problem is that yeah, we have uh, these external dependencies. Uh, and uh, yeah, we, we haven't uh, protected our own uh, system against uh, fallouts of these other external systems. That means uh, we have uh, cascading failures. That means, um, yeah, uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah. um, when our system wants to speak to a certain merchant system, uh, we... Uh, uh, that is not working properly in the, at the moment. Uh, at some point, simply our thread pool uh, runs uh, full and uh, yeah, stops the whole application uh, of uh, yeah, answering requests and the whole platform is down because uh, yeah, just one of these external merchant systems is not working properly. Um, yeah, what could we do in this situation? There is a pretty nice uh, book that was also mentioned in the talk before, uh, released from uh, Michael Nygaard. Um, yeah, that uh, uh, speaks a lot about different uh, stability patterns. Um, I think in, in total there are eight uh, that he mentions, but uh, we won't have a closer look on uh, three of them. The first thing uh, are timeouts. Um, yeah. It's a really stupid idea uh, when you um, uh, request another system to, to simply wait until you get an answer because you simply uh, have no idea uh, if everything works properly. So it makes really sense uh, at some point uh, yeah, to simply stop waiting, return uh, to your uh, normal uh, yeah, process and simply uh, yeah 
take it as a uh, failure and uh, go on with your work and handle this situation. Uh, timeouts are pretty common. Almost every client uh, library has them. Uh, yeah, but sometimes they are not set properly. Uh, another uh, good idea are actually uh, bulkheads. Uh, you know them uh, yeah, from chips. Uh, so normally uh, you are afraid that something happens and you uh, yeah, get some leak into your, uh, into your ship and uh, yeah, you want to avoid that uh, yeah, every, uh, the whole ship runs uh, full of water so it sinks. So uh, yeah, bulkheads uh, simply try to minimize uh, yeah, the damage and uh, to, uh, yeah, to uh, reduce it just to a certain space. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's uh, something that uh, is also a pretty nice idea. Uh, but that's a picture of the Titanic, so it also doesn't work always. Um, and in IT, we uh, yeah we can adopt these uh, ideas uh, in certain scenarios. Uh, you can uh, separate uh, thread pools from each other. Uh, you can have uh, different database connection pools. You can run your application on many instances, uh, on many servers, or even uh, uh, different data centers. And uh, yeah, so if one f fails, then uh, there are still others that work. So uh, yeah, you, you can reduce the damage that happens. A certain nice, uh, um, an additional nice. Uh, pattern is a circuit breaker pattern. Uh, yeah, you know it uh, from electricity uh, in your household. So uh, if uh, something detects that there is uh, yeah, uh, something not working properly, uh, it simply opens a circuit breaker and uh, uh, yeah, you don't have electricity anymore, but it's simply to avoid that something worse happens and I don't know, there will be a fire or something like that. And uh, there is a, simile, a similar pattern also in uh, programming, so that um, when you speak to uh, an external system and the circuit breaker uh, recognizes that um, yeah, the other system is not answering or that you always uh, get uh, answers that cause an exception, uh, yeah, you want to protect your application against that and you want to protect uh, the other system against uh, further requests so it can recover and uh, yeah, therefore we have this circuit breaker pattern. So if it detects that uh, something's going wrong, the circuit breaker opens. Uh, he doesn't get any requests uh, uh, through, the, through the other system and uh, sometimes in this whole half open state he just uh, sends a single request to the other system to see if it has recovered and if it has recovered uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, open. Uh, it's closing again the circuit breaker, and then you can uh, go on. Yeah. So these are all nice patterns, but uh, at some point it's really complicated to uh, implement them all yourself. So what's nice is there is a library for it that was also mentioned in the talk before. So I hope, uh, yeah, I don't tell you too, too much that you already know. Uh, Histrix is a library from Netflix. Um, uh, it, uh, yeah, it's more or less an implementation of the command pattern. Uh, it has uh, nice uh, metrics and a very nice dashboard to uh, monitor your uh, processes. That's something I will show later. Um, but it's actually an implementation of all these uh, uh, stability patterns I've shown you before. Um, and yeah, so now I show you how you can integrate Histrix into your application. Uh, Histrix is simply a library that you can yeah, uh, put into your application. And uh, a normal call to some external system would be like this. You simply yeah, use some HTTP client and wait for the answer. If you want to, have to use Histrix, uh, yeah, you simply wrap uh, your call uh, into this uh, run method here. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that's yeah, the most simple way to, to integrate it in your application. You uh, have these command groups where you can uh, yeah, group uh, commands into one bulkhead um, that is uh, yeah, actually related to a thread pool. 
Um, yeah, that's uh, a very easy way. You have all you have to do. You have to find the places in your code where uh, you are calling external systems and wrap it into a command. Um, to execute uh, that, uh, you yeah, you can. Uh, simply uh, create uh, all a command uh, that you uh, implemented before and uh, when you want to um, uh, uh, call it in a synchronous way you uh, yeah, simply uh, call execute and that lets the run method of your yeah, previous command uh, gets executed. Um, there is another nice way when you want to simply do it uh, in an asynchronous way. You don't have to change uh, your code or your command. Uh, you simply uh, yeah, use a Q command and uh, you get a future that you can uh, yeah, use later so they can be executed in parallel. Um, the thing is that, of course, uh, there is this situation where something doesn't uh, work right and uh, you have to uh, react to a uh, yeah, failure situation. So a good idea is to implement a fallback that is uh, yeah, automatically called when, uh, I don't know, a fallback, a timeout ha happens, uh, when the circuit breaker is open, when an exception uh, is thrown in the run method. And uh, because we have this... Uh, yeah, merchant uh, setup where we are simply searching for products that are offered by different merchants. When a merchant system is not uh, available, we simply don't include the result uh, in our search result. So we simply have a fallback here as a uh, an empty list as a fallback. Another scenario would be I don't know you want current data but th they are not available so in the fallback you simply talk to a cache or so that would be something that you also could do so after uh, stabilizing our system with Hystrix uh, yeah we have something like that we have different thread pools to all external dependencies and uh, yeah they are protected by Hystrix and uh, yeah we can yeah maybe uh, think about other scenarios, but first I want to show you the Hystrix dashboard in action. So, um, hmm? I don't see, I ah, hear. Um, yeah, so you can include uh, a module into your application that uh, publishes a, a stream with events that uh, are uh, published by Hystrix. And uh, you can then deploy a uh, yeah, dashboard application. And uh, yeah, this uh, then is able to uh, yeah, show you uh, the current situation of all your um, commands. Um, what I have here is, uh, is it running? I'm not sure. It should run. I just have a look if this reacts now. That is strange. That's exactly the situation I wanted to avoid. Um, I don't know, I don't want to de de debug it live. Uh, I'm really sorry because I tried everything and it uh, worked, but then I just tell you what, uh, yeah, what you see here. Um, nothing is readable. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, um, yeah, you you have uh, you can see. Uh, uh, yeah, this is a command where we always uh, send back a, a correct answer, and um, therefore it's null. Uh, null per percent are failing. Uh, of the commands, and here I'm sending back uh, randomly, uh, yeah, timeouts, so that sometimes the commands are failing and sometimes not. What I wanted to show you uh, was I wanted to, uh, yeah, just switch off the system, so you would see that the uh, uh, command uh, 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 switches to 100% failures, and the circuit breaker opens. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's really sad that I can't do that now. I think there is something yeah, wrong in the background. I don't know. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. So I um, want to continue with my talk. So after we uh, stabilized uh, our system with Systrix, uh, we have to think what uh, we can do next. Uh, so, we solved the stability uh, problem, and uh, yeah, we still have these other problems that uh, maintenance is difficult, features uh, need a lot of time, technology is outdated, and uh, so forth. And one of the reason, or the biggest reason, why that is, uh, why it is this way, um, is uh, yeah, that a monozone is a monolith. Yeah. Uh, it uh, has many hidden dependencies, uh, the module boundaries are not clear, um, and uh, yeah, business processes are distributed all over the system, so I don't know, this module changes something, and this module changes something, and uh, nobody really understands uh, anymore what, uh, what is happening inside. Uh, and it's just one technical platform, so and because it's so big, we simply can't. I don't know. We we can't switch from Java to Scala or whatever, or just uh, uh, switch to another version. So in the end, everything uh, depends on everything. And uh, yeah, what we want is really a clear cut. Um, and uh, yeah, what? Why are we uh, want this? Uh, yeah, we want to create smaller systems that are understandable, enhanceable, uh, that have cl clear boundaries and responsibilities, and yeah, they allow technical uh, diversity. Um, yeah, and when we ask customers to yeah to paint their architecture, normally you <laughs> get this. Um, yeah, this typical three-layer uh, architecture that in the end shows actually nothing. It's a typical monolithic architecture. Um, and what we would like to have is also some vertical cut. Uh, and there are two yeah, different approaches. So one is um, to, uh, yeah, to cut just the service layer into vertical slices and then you integrate in the UI. But that has actually the disadvantage that your UI can become also monolithic again. So you put a lot of dependency there and uh, yeah, in the, in the end you yeah, have almost the same problems as before. Or uh, you go in the direction of self-contained systems. Um, uh, yeah, and where every uh, of these uh, smaller systems has its own UI and uh, you integrate them on the UI level later. Um, the advantage of this vertical cut is that uh, yeah, each of this uh, system can it have its own uh, architecture. We call that micro-architecture. So they have their own uh, persistence layer. They have their internal uh, business logic that is just for their domain. Uh, they yeah, have, the, as I mentioned, this separate UI. Um, yeah, and you can... Uh, yeah, every uh, system can be developed in its own direction. You can deploy them, you can deploy them uh, separately, so you don't have to wait with the releases for other systems, uh, at least in many scenarios. Uh, and you try to limit the interaction, which is other. So, um, the question is, how do we cut these systems? So. Um, 
what is the what are the criteria to to find a, yeah a proper cut of these uh, vertical slices, and uh, that's is defined by the domain architecture. So uh, the s system boundaries are yeah actually reflected by the dependencies you find in your business. Yeah, so because uh, uh, yeah, normally. Uh, um, yeah, feature requests uh, happen regarding a certain uh, business uh, case, and uh, yeah, things that belong together yeah should also be uh, in a system. And uh, it also defines who is responsible for which data. What you want to avoid is that every uh, of these systems can uh, yeah actually change all data. So uh, that's something. Uh, where in the end you get integration on the database level, that is also something you don't want. So uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, what we have to do to get into this direction is uh, yeah, we have to move from an internal structure. I yeah, I simplified this a lot you, because normally you see, of course, a little bit more domain uh, uh, logic also in your package uh, structure. But uh, yeah, you also find all these cross cutting concerns and uh, yeah you have problems to find uh, where uh, a part of a certain business functionality is actually implemented and uh, yeah we want a, a cut of uh, yeah, autonomous systems that each uh, represent their own domain domains uh, so that's just an example pretty yeah basic but uh, I hope that you get the idea. Um, yeah, uh, the most really, it's one of the most difficult uh, questions to to answer is how do you come to a point where you know how your uh, yeah, architecture or how your system should be cut and. Um, the good thing is you already have your monolith and uh, you as developers, I think you are the persons who know the system best and you already had uh, have a lot of experience uh, where uh, things are not uh, cut in the right way, where uh, you normally get problems when uh, yeah, you implement a new feature. So uh, yeah, you are the persons who are yeah, maybe know the best who how the real dependency uh, depends uh, dependencies actually are uh, and uh, yeah a concept that you always hear when it's about cut of uh, microservices or uh, yeah, self-contained systems is uh, this concept from domain driven design bounded context so a bounded context is a context where i don't know a certain part of a domain model actually is very pretty autonomous and uh, there are processes around it that are just uh, related to this domain model and uh, yeah it's a good idea to uh, focus on identifying bounded context in your monoliths and uh, yeah try to make a system out of them so now you have many different systems but they are not connected already so what is the strategy behind uh, yeah how to connect them um, that is actually the domain of the ma macro uh, architecture so um, that's not like I don't know if in in a, in a, in a thing like uh, some soap based architecture for example where you have big uh, yeah, applications like enterprise service bus or something like that that have a monolithic tendency also. Uh, in this domain, you really, yeah, you define just standards where you all agree on. Yeah, that means, for example, you agree on how these separate uh, user interfaces of your various system uh, can be integrated or uh, which communication protocol you use in these days it's of course most of the time is simply HTTP uh, which uh, representation formats are exchanged and uh, yeah uh, how you deal with logging and monitoring for example because of course you want still have an overview of about uh, 
uh, yeah, your processes across uh, the system so that you can uh, yeah, get an idea what went wrong when something's not working properly. And uh, yeah, James Lewis and Martin Fowler uh, yeah, uh, said, or I think it's from their microservices article, uh, um, they have this nice slogan of smart endpoints and dump pipes. So you should really uh, create systems that know their domain pretty well. Yeah, so you can trust uh, that uh, everything that belongs to this uh, domain is uh, handled inside the system and uh, yeah, between these systems there shouldn't happen much logic anymore. Um, what are the consequences of such an architecture? Um, you always get when you talk about this with a customer uh, the question what's about what about uh, transactions? They uh, yeah, are worried that that doesn't work in such an architecture. The, the thing is that you simply shouldn't have uh, transactions that are yeah going over more than just one system. Therefore, the yeah the cut of the system is really important. So when you need transactions, it's of also often a, a sign that uh, that's maybe one domain. But you can also think about many asynchronous processes that uh, uh, where it's possible, it's uh, yeah a good idea to do, to do that, and that's. A, yeah, a sign that you can actually separate the business uh, domains. Um, but of course, when you need data for certain use cases, they are spread all over uh, various systems. And uh, so I'm coming to the next point. Uh, that means how do we connect these data that uh, yeah, are spread over these systems? And I have some fictional use case. Um, I now have uh, yeah, a search system that has a search index for all my uh, own uh, products and I have an inventory system that actually says uh, how many uh, 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 of these pro the, uh, products we have in our storage and that we can uh, sell uh, right now. And uh, we ask our merchant systems uh, if they have products regarding a certain uh, search. And uh, yeah, we want to collect all this data and show it to the user. Um, yeah, and uh, that's something you can do in a synchronous or an asynchronous way. Uh, <laughs> the point is when you do it in a synchronous way, uh, this red, uh, yeah, uh, uh, means that uh, that's a time when a system is simply waiting for uh, another system and so uh, you see that the uh, actual processing time is not really uh, so much but uh, yeah you are waiting a lot and it's really a waste of time to uh, to do that and therefore it's a really good idea to parallelize this stuff and uh, yeah I want to show you how that can work in a yeah, really nice way with uh, Rx Java. Um, Rx Java, uh, yeah, is actually uh, an implementation of the uh, reactive uh, extensions that were invented by uh, Microsoft. Uh, there are asynchronous streams, and they include elements of the iterator pattern, of the observable pa better observable pattern, and of functional uh, programming. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, you know all iterables, uh, and in Rx Java it simply switches from pull to push. Yeah, so you uh, you have uh, methods for uh, the next element uh, for errors and uh, for the case when your when you when a stream completes. But the difference to iterable is that you don't pull, you you get a notification for all these cases. And uh, yeah, the nice thing is that you can uh, build uh, streams uh, based on an observable pattern that might look like this. So um, these things are all happening uh, parallel, and uh, yeah, they uh, these different forms uh, yeah symbolize different kind of data and you have uh, operators uh, 
in between that, uh, I don't know, here they transform something, here they con combine certain streams and uh, yeah, that's another stream and here's another combining operator and in the end you get uh, one stream that uh, yeah, connects all this stuff and everything is asynchronous. That's uh, yeah, more or less a principle of RxJava, uh, but I show you that in more detail uh, now. Um, the nice thing about Hystrix, now we come back to Hystrix, is that it also uh, supports uh, Eric's Java. Actually, uh, Eric's Java is uh, yeah, part of uh, Hystrix. And uh, yeah, to get an observable, you can simply implement the uh, uh, Hystrix observable command. That's pretty new. It just uh, was published in Hystrix 1.4. Uh, and instead of... Uh, yeah, returning your real uh, object, you simply uh, return an observable. And uh, you also have a fallback. This time it's not get fallback, it's resume is fallback, and that is also an uh, observable. And uh, yeah, the, the a little bit tricky part is because this observable always uh, represents a stream of data is that when a uh, a failure happens here, it interrupts this stream and it continues with, with this one. So sometimes it's a little bit tricky to yeah to get an idea what a, a fallback in a in an observable scenario actually means. Um, in Eric's Java you have these nice uh, Marvel diagrams. Uh, it's the yeah the whole RP uh, documentation uh, contains these uh, Marvel diagrams. Um, and uh, I explain uh, you a few of them. Um, so this is actually uh, the stream uh, that we are publishing first. Then you have some kind of uh, operator. In this case, it's a map. So for each of these elements, we uh, are executing this function. And uh, yeah, you see that you get a new stream that uh, yeah has the transformed elements that were transformed by the function that is defined here. And uh, yeah, in our case, um, we uh, what we need to do because, um, yeah, uh, I think I showed here, each of these merchant uh, system, of course, has uh, yeah, their own product uh, yeah, representation that is not actually uh, yeah, consistent with our own product uh, Implementation, so um, yeah, we can just map them to uh, to our search result uh, uh, object, and uh, yeah, we can do that on every stream. So uh, yeah, in the end, after this uh, step, we get an observable with search results. Um, because we have many different uh, merchant systems all with their own uh, logic we can also merge streams yeah so uh, we uh, have two streams and uh, we combine them to one stream with all the elements that are here this means an error case so when this happens uh, yeah the, the stream simply ends uh, we are doing this in the code by uh, yeah uh, calling simply uh, merge on one of obso the observables and uh, yeah give them give it uh, this other observable as an argument and the result is that we get a new observable with a stream of um, yeah the product of both of these uh, systems then there is another concept that is also well known from uh, functional programming um, flat map uh, that's useful when you have a stream of uh, data and you want to create a new observable based of each on these items. And uh, yeah, when we would use map here, we would get, would get simply uh, uh, many observables, but we don't want observables. In this case, we want one observable with the elements of each of these observables. Is that understandable? Um, yeah. and. Uh, because uh, we are creating um, yeah, uh, an observable here, um, we are, or in the example I show you uh, soon, 
we have uh, two observables that we are creating and we want to combine elements of these. We are also using the zip uh, operator that is uh, yeah, building pairs for two streams. And uh, yeah, I show you uh, that also. Because now I'm uh, speaking about this case from the beginning. Uh, I just go back. Uh, where the, the first example with uh, merging uh, streams was here, uh, where we are, were talking about the merchant systems. And now I'm talking uh, about we have an, a search index, we want more detailed information from the product system, and we want to map how many uh, products of this we have uh, in our storage. Um, yeah, and that's happening here. Uh, first, we uh, talk to our product uh, index, our uh, search engine. Uh, then uh, we are uh, creating, uh, yeah, we are creating an observable based on this. This observable, uh, yeah, gets flat mapped to two observables. Uh, one uh, observable uh, represents a call to the product system, where we get. Uh, yeah, more detailed information about the product, and another observable re represents a, a request to uh, um, to the inventory system, and in the end we combine them uh, with zip so that we are having a pair of uh, yeah detailed product information with uh, the current amount of uh, products in our uh, inventory. And uh, yeah, the, uh, uh, the result is a stream of uh, uh, yeah, products that have information about product details and the products on stock. Uh, and in the end, we are merging these two again. So these are the external, uh, this external system stuff from the um, uh, merchant systems, and that is from our internal systems. And uh, yeah, now you really can see why it's an observable pattern because when you uh, want to uh, actually listen to this stream of data, you have to su subscribe. And uh, yeah, we are uh, just uh, transform this into an array list, and then we yeah uh, we have our search result search results uh, yeah uh, another way to 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 uh, achieve this would be simply to transform the stream into uh, yeah an iterator you can simply say I want to transform this uh, in a blocking manner and you get your iterator and you transform it into an array list and then you simply return this um, yeah in the end we have something like this we have many systems that are protected by Hystrix, connected by some asynchronous logic uh, based on Eric's Java. Um, but what is important for me to say is, um, when it's about system modernization, uh, it makes ab absolutely sense. Not uh, yeah, you don't have to uh, yeah build all these microsystems in. Uh, yeah, one uh, uh, action or so. It means, uh, I don't know, it's absolutely okay when you know, uh, I don't know, I have a certain area where we are not flexible, where we want to be, uh, want to be more flexible. Um, we extract this functionality into a different uh, service and we can modernize this, uh, this area and uh, in the, in the um, other parts we simply live with our monolith. So it's really something that... Uh, yeah, that uh, makes also sense uh, if you don't do everything, uh, uh, yeah, in in one step or so. Um, so, uh, how could you start? Um, uh, yeah, the point is really um, I can't give you a clear recommendation uh, because. As I said, it really depends a lot on your domain, uh, of on your experience with your system, and uh, it's really something uh, you can follow certain principles. But um, 
it's really about your system and you have to find the uh, uh, right way for your system. And my goal was mainly to make you curious because uh, Hystrix has its own complexity, this microservice stuff has its own complexity and uh, Rx Java definitely has its own uh, complexity, uh, especially regarding Rx Java. I could really show you just, uh, yeah, really, just a really small piece of what is possible. And uh, what I was doing with it is really not what you call uh, yeah, a reactive system. That's a different story. Yeah, I want to encourage uh, you to find your own way. And uh, yeah, my summary is that uh, Hystrix is a great way to stabilize your system. Um, it makes absolutely sense if you don't have, I don't know, the possibility to do some of the other stuff. Hystrix already helps a lot. Uh, we are doing this a lot in uh, older uh, architecture uh, environments and uh, it's really just great because uh, um, the effort is really not so big and uh, you gain a lot. Uh, Rx Java is a really nice uh, way to uh, yeah, increase the amount of asynchronous processes and uh, microservices are a great way to get control over your system again. Yeah, that's was it from my side? I'm really sorry that the demo didn't work. I will find out later and I think uh, five minutes after the talk I will understand why it didn't work, but yeah, I don't know. So, uh, that was it from my side. Any questions? Uh, how do you manage multiple microservices deployment and versions compatibility and microservices compatibility? How do you manage it? Um, it's, uh, yeah, that's uh, uh, a problem, of course. Um, the point is, uh, that's why we make this difference uh, between uh, micro and macro architecture, yeah? Because in the macro architecture, we really define stuff that um, uh, yeah, shouldn't change so much. Yeah? So um, uh, everything regarding interfaces um, uh, is uh, more or less uh, yeah, part of the macro architecture. So uh, regarding micro architecture, you can change everything all the time that doesn't affect any other system. Yeah? And um, uh, regarding macro architecture, you need some kind of uh, coordination where, uh, I don't know, you uh, talk to others uh, that might be affected by your changes. But the, the goal is, uh, and that's an improvement to the old monolithic approach, uh, uh, that you don't have need this coordination for every single uh, change. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And uh, when you uh, really uh, have releases that might break, uh, other systems uh, interfaces, of course, you can also speak about versioning and uh, uh, offering different versions of an interface and so forth. Hmm? Do, you, do you use any tools to manage it? Uh, in these uh, areas where we're using uh, it right now, we don't uh, use any tools. There are some, uh, I don't know, there's something from Netflix, for example, uh, uh, some, uh, yeah, uh, service uh, rep repository or so, but uh, I think we are more on the side that we, um, uh, yeah, our systems are not totally micro, I would say, yeah, so we still have a uh, reasonable amount uh, of, uh, yeah, um, uh, overview, I would say, yeah, because I think, for example, in an environment uh, like Netflix, they have a totally different business case as a usual enterprise, uh, company yeah they um, uh, and my experience is that uh, I don't know the cut shouldn't be too micro uh, what can you say about uh, the bug in this uh, synchronous code written using uh, Eric Java? Uh, because, uh, for example, for, for, for example, stick traces, yeah, when you have a synchronous code, so then it is sometimes hard to, to, to debug that. F 
comparing to, for, there is a s service called Simple Workflow in, in AWS. It, it, I, I wouldn't say it's good, but they, for example, provide you uh, ability, they, they join, they, they provide you a full stack trace, which is easier to, for example, debug. Does a Rex Java provide something like this? I mean, does it help you to, de to debug your Rex code? You have normal stack traces, of course. Uh, you have still an exception that is thrown at a point uh, because in the end you have uh, still uh, snippets of synchronous uh, stuff in all these functions. Yeah, but your code uh, gets executed uh, not at the point you uh, uh, defined this, right? Again? Uh, your code gets executed yeah. in the different point, not in the point when you define this. It, it gets executed at the Yeah, yeah but what I didn't show, for example, um, uh, I really showed the, the happy pass. Um, uh, you can implement this on uh, error stuff, and uh, when you create an uh, obs uh, observable in a more detailed way than, than I did, you can simply send an event to the... To the um, to the observable, uh, to the subscriber with additional uh, information about the, the exception that happened. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>